My name is Darren Lapomi. I have been in my position as a PI. Uh, this is for nine full years. Actually, my um, the the 10th anniversary of my first day was on July 1st. So it's a good time to sit back and sort of reflect on some of the things that I've learned about mentoring now that I've seen the uh, now that I've seen the PI selection process uh, a few different times as a student and as an incoming postdoc and now as somebody who uh, who who hires uh, or who selects students uh, for my research group. So these are not rules. Um, by the way, it's just me talking. I'm going to talk for about. 20 minutes or so, and then I hope to have a discussion. So I don't have uh, I don't have slides. So these are not really rules, but more of considerations. Um, I don't like to be so dogmatic as to say that these are the rules that you need to follow because this is such a personal decision that it's really impossible to uh, to distill these into into rules like the F equals M A of uh, of choosing an advisor. Nevertheless. This will be one of the most important decisions that you ever make in your life. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to make it at a time when you have basically the least amount of uh, experience and, and knowledge to make the judgment that, uh, that will lead you to the best, uh, the best decision. Um, and so what I hope to do is to be able to tell you about some of the considerations uh, on which you should put your weight when you're making, uh, that, that you should wait to make this decision. So it's complicated by the fact that you're heavily emotionally involved in this decision, and a lot of your planning can sort of go out the window uh, just under the pressure to make a decision. So you might be visiting a campus in February, and maybe you have to make a decision by April 15th, and that decision will affect not just the next four to six years during the PhD, but also your relationship with the school that you did your degree in and the advisor with whom you did your degree uh, who may need to support you going forward in your career. A lot of this will depend on your personal risk assessment too. So you have to be able to anticipate how you're going to respond to external forces. And a lot of times this is brought up in the area of personal finance. Like do I, uh, you know, now that I'm, I'm not a student and, and I'm in, you know, investing in like maybe a bond fund and maybe a stock market fund and one has more risk than the other uh, and and the there's no right answer of what uh, what distribution you're going to put your money in uh, but you have to know something about your own uh, risk tolerance and the way that external events are going to affect your mental health which is another huge part of the decision to choose a pi and a program and a department so there are six considerations that I'm going to talk about. There are four real considerations, and there are two sort of pre-flight considerations. So, there's, so this is consideration negative one. <laughs> and the negative first, the negative one consideration is, should you go to grad school in the first place? And the answer is yes, if you love research, because Four to six years is a lot of time in your 20s to be making uh, less than minimum wage um, in, a, uh, in a new place, uh, in a place that has an undetermined, uh, undefined relationship or poorly defined, poorly delineated relationship with your advisor and possibly your, uh, your coworkers. So you have to actually love research and not go just because you've always been in school and are afraid of the real world. And I admit to falling into this category big time. Uh, when I was applying to grad school, like I did not want to apply for a job in the real world. I liked school, I liked my undergraduate lab, and I wanted to keep doing it. Um, and maybe that's a maybe that's a good decision maybe uh you know maybe it wasn't it's hard to come up with a counterfactual and say how my life would have been if i didn't go to grad school should you go to grad school in the first place the next consideration or the next uh next next question to ask yourself 
is do you still want to go knowing that a PhD is more consuming than a full-time job? So chances are you'll be putting more than 40 hours a week into the lab. You might not be in the lab for more than, you know, 25 hours a week, but you will be thinking about your research for probably 50 or 60 hours a week, even if you're not in the building. It is, uh, it is consuming. So creating, uh, deciding to do a, uh, a, 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 a PhD degree, um, is a commitment to obtaining a uh, what I would call a black belt in creating knowledge. So you want to put that dent into the unknown. And sometimes that your project doesn't want to uh, to yield to your uh, your efforts. And uh, it can be very frustrating at times. Um, and it's not like a position where you clock in at nine and you clock out at five. Um, you're going to be taking, if not the work home with you, you're going to be taking the emotion from the work uh, with you. You're going to be thinking about atoms and molecules um, before you go to bed. Uh, and whether you want to or not, you know, it's a little bit like playing Tetris. You're going to see those blocks falling. You're going to see those bonds being formed and, uh, and, and broken. Keep in mind that if you're applying to, to a PhD program because you want to become a professor yourself, know, uh, know that with this mindset. Graduate education uh, is not quite a pyramid scheme, but it has some characteristics of a pyramid scheme. Only about 5% of PhDs in all academic fields are employed as tenure track professors. And it's just a numbers game. It's the fact that a lab might have, uh, have five people in it. It might have 20 or 40 people in it. And there's only one professor. And a professor position is a lot like a professional musician in, a, in an orchestra or an opera. That first chair trombonist might not retire for another 30 years for that position to open up again. And it's, and it's a numbers game. So know, so learn about the full gamut of options available to PhD scientists before making the decision to do a PhD. That's, so that's one of our pre-flight considerations. That's consideration negative one. Consideration zero is the research topic. And this is not quite independent of your the choice to join a particular uh, PI's lab in a particular university, but it is something that is very closely related to the, uh, the work you feel good about doing the work that you uh, that you want to, uh, to to do in the future. So the right topic, the right research topic will probably be some balance of what you're most excited about. That is, you're excited about the basic research or maybe the longer term application or maybe some combination. You're excited about the uh, working with a particular PI or and you're excited about the group culture. So that it's the, the right topic is a combination of these things, the topic itself. So how does it excite you, the PI and the group culture? What I would say is not to res don't restrict yourself to the topic of your undergraduate research. So the topic of your undergraduate research might be completely random. You might have chosen it randomly. Chances are it was kind of random. You might have knocked on five professors' doors or sent out 20 emails, and maybe only one person responded. Or maybe three people, re three people responded, and you found you know, what you thought was the best one, and you explored that opportunity. Or maybe you applied to a summer fellowship or an REU, and maybe there was one, uh, one lab that you, uh, that you got into, uh, and you ended up joining that lab. Or maybe you had a choice of 10 labs, but you didn't have the background uh, to, to, uh, to choose based on the paragraph description or maybe what was on the website, if the professor even had a website, and you just kind of chose it. And chances are, if you want to go to grad school, you probably ended up liking that topic. But the reason you like that topic might not necessarily be because it's what you knew that you wanted to do originally. It's because probably you became good at it and people tend to like what they become good at. So uh, one, 
one thing that I would that I would caution you against is choosing exactly your undergraduate research topic in graduate school because people don't really grow unless they move um, a little bit at least uh, between topics. I think that uh, that human beings in general tend to uh, tend to stay stagnant a little bit because they spend their precious moments doing what they already know how to do. For example, um, I play the piano a little bit. I'm not as good as, uh, as I should be for somebody who's been playing as long as I have. And the reason is because I only play what I sound good playing and because to learn something new is disheartening. Um, you don't feel like you're very good at it. You feel like people are judging you for it. And, uh, and the tendency is just to reinforce what we already know. There are some fields, however, where some PIs may not hire you unless you have a very specific undergraduate training. Um, a good example is, um, I don't want to get in trouble, but there are some fields within maybe hardcore organic synthesis where if you, the PI doesn't know that you, that you like doing uh, uh, setting up a lot of chemical reactions, doing, uh, doing um, uh, biphasic workups and a SEP funnel, doing, uh, doing columns and NMRs, and uh, and you don't know that you like to do that. That might be a topic that you want to uh, that that you might want to avoid. Um, however, if a PI is going to reject you um, because you don't have some very specific undergraduate training, it might say more about the PI and maybe the field than it says about you. Okay. Those are the two pre-flight considerations. So, so negative one is should you go to, to grad school in the first place? And then consideration zero is the research topic. So here are the real, the real considerations. All right, consideration one, should you join an established lab or a lab of an up and coming PI? So there are big name PIs and super labs that have say more than 20 grad students and postdocs that often uh, get a lot of papers and have a lot of funding, but they have significant disadvantages. For example, um, students have to be highly self-motivated or they will languish. Uh, oftentimes the PIs of these labs don't have a lot of time to spend with their students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That was basically how my, uh, how my research uh, lab was as a graduate student. Uh, we had um, maybe 30, by the time I graduated, we had something like 35 uh, postdocs and five grad students in my lab. And my PI was out of town maybe 75% of the year. And I gave one group meeting per year for five years. And we had maybe five meetings where we actually talked about my, uh, my life and career. Um, and was that an ideal scenario? Um, maybe, it, maybe it was for some people. Um, I probably would have gotten more out of my, uh, my relationship with my advisor if they were actually around. On the flip side, uh, my PhD advisor was able to, uh, to, to write a letter that had a lot of weight because people knew who he, uh, who he was. Interestingly, when I moved to my, uh, my postdoc, my postdoc advisor was also, uh, famous, but she was not quite as famous, but the lab was actually bigger during the time that I was there than, than my PhD lab, uh, and she did actually make the time to uh, to meet with us on a biweekly basis, which was uh, which was wonderful. So one size does not fit all in terms of big versus uh, versus small, but these are some of the aspects of that decision. Another issue facing large labs is that there is a potential for a low level of not just quality control of the research output, but also the depth of scholarship that's possible in these huge labs. And this is something, this is understanding that I only really came to recently uh, once I started my own lab. And that is, if I get a really deep scholarly piece of work from a student or a postdoc, it takes me 
probably the better part of six consecutive weekends. You know, we iterate during the week, the, the student maybe sends it back, maybe it takes a few weeks or a month to send it back. And then I might take all of my, you know, all of my downtime on like in evenings or weekends. Let's say it's a full Saturday worth of time when I'm not getting any incoming from department uh, requests or requests to review manuscripts or grants or something like that. It takes a long time for the PI to be able to provide quality advice, to provide quality scholarly guidance on deep pieces of scholarship and really impactful papers. And if a deep scholarly paper emerges from a super lab, it's almost certainly because of an especially good postdoc or senior grad student who did uh, all of the heavy lifting or most of the heavy lifting by themselves. I just don't believe that a, uh, that a PI of a super lab can really put all that much thought at all into a really deep piece, uh, piece of work. And, uh, and what that says maybe is that if a deep piece of work does come out of a group uh, of a super lab, could it have been better if the PI actually had time to devote to it? Probably yes. In looking at up and coming labs, it is often good to look at the derivative of the productivity. So it is much better to be in a place where there is a lot of excitement, there's a lot of uh, growth, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of innovation and innovation and, and growth and quality that you perceive to be increasing when observed from the outside. In a, and that's much easier to find in an up and coming lab with a younger or newer PI. In an older uh, uh, PI's laboratory, they might be uh, in, in, they're more likely to be at a, at a mesa. They're more likely to be at a, at a, at a plateau. All right, consideration number two has to do with group culture. So ideally, you want to be in a place where your happiness is as decoupled as possible from the day-to-day -day success of your specific project. So there will be months that go by where literally nothing good happens. So when I was a graduate student, I started in 2005, and I didn't have my first paper until 2008. For the first two years, basically nothing worked. And the way that I was able to get through that period of time was by having a group of supportive, uh, in that, in my case, a supportive postdoc mentors who were able to, uh, to shepherd me through the, uh, this, this difficult uh, process. So what you should do during your visitation period is to talk to as many graduate students as possible and ask yourselves, are the students excited, healthy, happy with their progress? Are they collaborative? Uh, do, does the lab value uh, diversity of sex, race, gender, religion, and perhaps especially personality types? Do they value um, having, uh, having introverts and extroverts? Do they value, uh, do they value this kind of, uh, of diversity? The reason that, uh, that you don't want a, uh, a monolithic lab is not only because it leads to, uh, is because not only is it better for, uh, is it better for, uh, for the science and it's better for the people in the lab, um, but also uh, it provides a, for, a, a place of resilience. If people approach problems, from, uh, problems in climate, in culture from different, and in science from different perspectives, uh, then, then there is resilience built into the lab, and that can be emotional as well as scientific because isolation is one of the surest routes to, to, uh, to depression and being united by a common mission like a collaborative project or a supportive group is the surest uh, bulwark, uh, surest cure uh, against uh, despair. Also, on the topic of talking to as many graduate students as possible, a lot of them will actually, uh, a lot of the grad students will actually give you the, the rosy picture of the lab and maybe uh and and even in labs where things are not going really well uh they might uh they might still give you a, a uh, an overly positive picture 
And that's why these physical characteristics like excited, healthy, happy, um, you know, ask them specifically, ask students in other labs how another someone in another lab would ask would answer their the same question and these are ways of getting at the truth uh, when people may not be a hundred percent forthcoming and it's not because they uh they they want to deceive you it's rather that um it's rather that people like to justify their own choices and they also uh they also May, just may be feeling good that day, and they may they may tell you what feels good to them to say. Not not everywhere, but just know that this is uh, that this is potentially an issue. So consider, consideration number three is the PI themselves. So we're going to assume that most PIs, at least the PIs that you are considering, are competent researchers. They're experts in their topics, and they're doing something new and interesting. If the PI doesn't check the scientific boxes, then look elsewhere to begin with. So what you want to do is choose a PI who will allow you to flourish. And what does that mean? That means, uh, that means support when you want it. It means clarity of expectations. Um, and a lot of what I said about, and, and look at the culture as well. So a lot of what I said about group culture also applies to the PI because the PI influences the culture by the way in which they do their hiring. So these are quantitative things that you can ask. Try to find out not only if the people in the lab have gotten the types of positions that you want, um, but also that the, uh, that the people who left the lab are still getting support if, they, uh, if they're asking for it. That tells you that a PI is interested in your success after you, uh, after you leave. Also try to find out the attrition rate or whether students have left the group under less than amicable circumstances. So PIs are going to try to put their best foot forward in the visitation weekend, and it's uh, a little hard to judge the future, but you can get a sense of trust and openness uh, from an advisor by asking uh, questions like this. Um, questions that might be like perceived as a turnoff are how many hours you require. Um, there are ways of asking that question that have that uh, that ask the professor to, uh, to, to be clear about their expectations. So get them to talk about their expectations for how much progress do you expect, you know, week by week, how many publications or what quality of publications or how many dis discoveries or, uh, or whether or not I need to come up with my own idea at some point, whether or not there's a theory or, and modeling component to this work, uh, or, or, or will that be required of me in order to graduate down the line? These are the kinds of things that are a bit more, that you'll get more information from than simply asking uh, how many hours do you expect. Um, those are something, those are things that you can ask the students, just ask like, what's a typical day like? for you and that's a that's a very easy way to get the information that you need. Okay, finally, consideration 4 that has to do with the institution and the location. So, I'm not going to um, you know, be a, a hypocrite and say that a, a degree from a fancy school uh, means nothing because it does mean a little bit to some uh, people. There is a uh, there is a type of of it's a type of pre vetting that says that if you got into this highly ranked institution, somebody else has already done the hard work of judging how you know how how good you are, um, which is you know kind of ridiculous because by the time you apply for a job, um, somebody made that decision. Um, uh, four to six years ago, and that decision is made without any like reference to what you actually did during your PhD. So that's kind of like a kind of not a good metric. Um, what you want to do is, um, is is so you know along the same lines. There are some top tier companies uh, that I won't name that uh, that sort of already place your application in a bucket depending on the PhD institution and and give a salary premium to people from those uh, from those places. And in some sense, you can understand because like 
they're trying to de-risk their their process. Um, but there is there are a lot of sources of inequity that that type of binning um, ex, uh, um, uh, uh, produces. That is really a bad uh, a bad thing, um, especially because the PIs at the top places, like the top five places in whatever field you're in, are not usually regarded as the most attentive mentors. There is a lot of attrition in those labs. There is a lot of, of, uh, of mastering out in for that is for people who intended to get a PhD but left on less than amicable terms with their advisor. And the higher up the, uh, the, the chain of U.S. News and World Report, the more likely you are to find um, an inattentive advisor. And that's, uh, that is the, the other side of the, uh, of the coin. The PI is much more important overall than the program or the department. Um, and the department actually has very little influence on your life after the first year. As to the location, uh, say a cold school, a school in a cold place or a warm place or, or some distance from home or an international place, uh, that's a highly personal decision and I really don't have any insights about it um, uh, because of how personal it is. Uh, most people committed enough to research will find that they don't have um, a lot of options and, and go where they get into grad school or a postdoc um, or a job. So, uh, so that said, um, going to grad school was the best, uh, one of the best decisions that I've actually made. And, uh, and I, I, um, I, 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 I believe in, uh, in, uh, in, in all of you to make like a good decision here. I'm, it's like, it's always so humbling to, be around people that want to take four to six years of uh, of their 20s or 30s and devote it to creating knowledge uh, and uh, and doing great things with it and this is a uh, this is a, a a critical step in that process and i hope i've said uh, something useful here and i'm happy to have a discussion if the chance of getting a faculty position is only about five percent should i even bother if i don't get into a top 10 school Sure. So the 5% number does not apply necessarily to, uh, to, to chemistry. Um, each field is a, it, that's all PhDs granted in all uh, PhD programs in the United States. In engineering, the number is higher. Uh, so engineers, um, the, the labs tend to be smaller um, and uh, and also there is kind of like a burgeoning of engineering departments and the sizes of departments, and they're actually growing. So a lot of places are actually taking on new faculty members. Um, the university system as like a business um, is actually growing. It, it would be like, it would be a good time to invest in like the R1 institution, if that were an asset class, because of the the types of, of uh, investments that are flowing into R1 universities. To answer the specific question, if you were not able to get into a school in the top 20, are your dreams of becoming a, uh, a professor dashed? Um, absolutely not. Um, and the reason is because nobody, uh, you can't say like how productive you're going to be during that time um, when you, by at the time that you apply you know you might make a substantial discovery uh, you might end up with a phone book of jack's papers um, you might be there at a time when the ranking of the university changes for the better um, when I started at my position UCSD was the engineering school was number 17 now it's number nine. So uh, things change all the time, and five years is not, a, is not a long time for them to change. 
The other consideration is that most people, um, everybody doing, uh, every, everybody who wants a faculty position in chemistry um, should, and, and because of the, the ACS um, uh, tie-in to this event, I'll, I'll say chemistry, uh, everyone doing a PhD in chemistry, biology, or physics needs to do a postdoc in order to get a, a faculty position at an R1 institution. Um, is it easier in the top 20? Uh, those schools tend to be a little bit, you know, more resourced, but does it dash your dreams? Um, absolutely not. And, uh, and there is good uh, science to be done everywhere, and, the, and you never know what's going to happen. Um, this is one of the surest things about life is the uncertainty, and a lot of times it works out in your favor as well. Even if you, like, this is a, like a, like a meditation trick, like chocolate meditation. They, they say, like, have a bite of chocolate and really internalize how it, how it makes your senses, you know, respond and think about all the, you know, the farmers and the supply chain and everything that went into it. Now, the chocolate taste has dissipated. And now try to recall or try to anticipate what that next bite is going to taste like. And you can't do it. You put it in your mouth and the experience is, is different. Uh, and, uh, and if, if we don't even know like what our moment to moment experience is going to feel like, we have no idea what's going to happen when we decide to go into a, uh, a new graduate program. So anything can happen. If we indicate diverse research interests on our personal statement, are we digging ourselves a hole? This will differ depending on the, on the committee and whether or not the PIs are making direct offers or whether or not the students are admitted as a, as a cohort. To me, when somebody has diverse interests, it's a good thing um, if I'm reading the application. Um, I can't speak more broadly um, in cohort type programs where everyone is admitted at once um, without specific matching to an advisor. Um, it's probably not a, it's not a bad thing at all. Do I need to have a paper in order to get into a top lab? I put a lot of stock in papers and not and and there are some equity issues around uh, using papers as a metric for admission for graduate admissions because not everybody has access to uh, to a research lab not everybody can you know volunteer in a lab long enough to get a paper um, and and so forth uh, but if you have a paper from a master's program that is maybe not the most prominent program, that would tell me that you have sought out the resources and have a commitment to, uh, to, to research. So ultimately, and that's a very positive thing. So ultimately, we look at a, you know, at a, at a gamut of characteristics when making our decisions, but that would strike me as a very positive attribute in an application. How did COVID affect graduate admissions the last two years? It's hard to say uh, from the PI's side. Um, I have the impression that it went, uh, so, so in the 2020 cycle, we actually had our visitation right before COVID restrictions. Uh, this year, this past year was 100% was uh, remote. Um, I was actually, uh, I didn't, neither of the students I made offers to decided to come here. So I, I came up empty and ended up promoting a master's student to a PhD. Um, and that's how I filled that, uh, that slot. Um, and I'm, you know, very happy with that, uh, with that decision. Um, it's, it's hard to say, I might have to take a, I might have to take a pass on that question, but I have the feeling that, that people, um, you know, that, it, that it went fairly well, all things considered. Um, and at least students didn't have to fly to multiple, you know, different places and be exhausted and give sweaty handshakes to, <laughs> ten, you know, nervous handshakes to, to 12 different faculty. What is the best way to find the research interests of PIs? A highly underutilized function is Twitter search. <laughs> So if you can go on uh, on Twitter and and find these PIs, a lot of them do have a social media presence. I would use YouTube as well. Um, most P 
PIs that are active like at all in their fields will have at least one talk that's on YouTube and that is a great place to find it. The ACS website, probably not. The school websites, um, they are sometimes updated, but sometimes they're often out of date. Um, I would look for stuff that the PI or the PI's lab group has, uh, has curated relatively, you know, regularly, regularly. How many PIs at each institution should you want to work for before deciding to go to that school? I think it's best to have one uh, top choice and then at least one other backup, probably two other backups. So when I applied, I, uh, I did not end up joining the first two labs that I rotated in. Um, my first choice at the time that I applied was not my first choice once I arrived. Um, I joined the, the lab of the third PI that I rotated with. And not every department, not every type of department has, uh, has rotations. They tend to be more common in chemistry and the natural sciences in general, um, because simply because the, the, uh, the students can be supported by TA ships during the first year while they're doing their rotations. Do graduate programs admit students as a pool, or do they admit directly to professors' labs? This is a very important point that you bring up, and it's important because admissions work differently. There are a few different models. It's like direct to PI. There is admitted as a cohort. There is, uh, there is rotation systems. Make sure to ask the director of the of graduate studies or the person in the administration's office in the department office how that program works because if you're going to spend a hundred or 120 dollars on the application fee um, hopefully you can get that waived if possible um, if you're going to do that uh, then you want to know that you have the best chance or you want to know how that system operates and don't just send in an application blindly without asking the specific, you know, if it's a case where a professor needs to be aware of your application, make sure that that professor knows if it's that kind of school. What are the red flags that tell you that you should not join a particular lab? <laughs> the, red, the red flags are high attrition rates, the red flags are students not getting the type of employment that they wanted uh, after um, after going into uh, uh, th that they wanted when they started the graduate program. I would look for evidence that the students are uh, are depressed or that there are people who have been in the lab for seven or more years, I think those are red flags. If I thought I wanted to do the PhD, would it ever make sense to apply to a terminal MS and then switch up once I'm there? I would almost always apply to the PhD program uh, because the program will pay for it and the priority for TA ships are usually given to PhD students and not master's students. Um, there are the, the reason to apply for, for a master's degree, if the program even allows you to apply to a terminal master's degree, um, a lot of chemistry departments don't allow it. Most engineering departments do allow it. Um, but if you apply directly to the, to the master's program, know that TA positions are hard to get and that you may be on the hook for the whole tuition. Um, but if you have some financial flexibility, it may make sense to, uh, to do it. How should I make the decision between two different research groups who pursue similar topics? I would make a decision between similar between laboratories with different with similar research topics based on the uh, on your comfort level hanging out in that group. Like try to because ultimately a, a human being can do like any kind of work as long as they enjoy the environment. <laughs> and of course that's not like it's not a it's not a rule, but there sometimes you'll find yourself in a task like 
stuffing envelopes. I did that the other day, like with our student services office to like stuff envelopes to be mailed out. And that was like such a fun afternoon because I really enjoyed talking to the other staff members at the uh, at the event. It doesn't didn't use my degree. It didn't engage me like into like the work itself didn't engage me intellectually. But the same thing is true in 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 your, you know, your the the work that you that you ostensibly love, like your science work. Um, if I liked one topic or one downstream application, 10% less less than another, but I like the people in that group 100% more, or I like the support that I was getting from the advisor 100% more. There's no question which way I would, I would, I would go, um, even if it were a much smaller di difference. How should I interpret it if a PI does not return my email? I, I hate when professors don't respond to, to student inquiries. The only I respond to every student inquiry except for when I get an email, there is no indication at all that the applicant even knows what I work on. <laughs> um, those I will not respond to because they were they were obviously like sent to a hundred people all at once. Um, the the if if you send a thoughtful email that explains what you are interested in and why you are interested in that person's research and some evidence maybe that you've read one of their papers or that you saw one of their YouTube talks or that you read their Twitter feed and that you really like what they say in their Twitter feed and you still don't get a response, forget that person. If I know that a lab doesn't have a lot of funding but I want to join anyway, would it make sense to TA every semester? There have to be some fairly significant um, compensatory reasons to join a lab knowing that you would have to TA every semester. I know people who have done it. They tend to find a way to adapt. Uh, and if they teach the same course over and over and over again, they might be able to spend a lot less time, uh, you know, each consecutive year. So say a, a typical full-time TA position is 20 hours per week. And maybe if they've taught the course a few semesters in a row, they might be able to get that down to six hours per week. Um, but grading, <laughs> grading takes a long time. Um, maybe now with everything uh, being on Canvas or Blackboard or whatever, uh, a lot more grading can be automated and it's easier, uh, but it's it still can be a lot of time. If, however, the advisor like is known to be supportive, um, maybe it's a sacrifice that you that you can make. What is the process for switching labs if you find that you're in a toxic environment? I would say that half of the graduate students in my lab historically started elsewhere. So it is that is in other labs or were master's students um, and converted to a to a PhD, so, uh, often master's students in another lab. So this happens a lot in my experience. Um, it is not as difficult as people tend to think it is, but it is still difficult. There are, however, support structures. There are at some universities special sources of funding, special sources of bridge funding, or if you quit one lab, they will actually pay your expenses for maybe one quarter um, or a semester in order to find a, uh, another solution. You can oftentimes um, do a TA ship during that quarter. I would reach out to people who are, uh, who are professionals in managing this type of dispute. So every, um, almost every divi academic division has an associate dean for students. Uh, this is a professor who, uh, who has this role of 
the student experience and is ultimately responsible for student success and will have uh, will know what resources are available if it's a particularly toxic experience uh, toxic relationship with a with an advisor then there are also mental health counselors on every campus and uh, and that that is an underutilized resource in my experience um, it's why it's uh, it's important during your orientation period and uh, to, to to make uh, friends, to make uh, to develop relationships um, uh, outside of just the one with your PI, in case that relationship uh, goes goes south. But there are a couple different reasons. You know, there are multiple reasons why one might want to leave a lab. One is a toxic relationship with a PI. Another is because the research isn't working or is not what you thought it was going to be. And those those necessitate different choices and where to go for remediation. If I want to go to industry after my PhD, when should I bring this up to my prospective advisor? Professors who are not supportive of industry careers should not be professors. Um, that is a massive red flag. Red flag. We were talking about red flags. Um, a professor has to know that they only need to train one person to become a professor in their career in order to like replace them when they retire. <laughs> you know, maybe two given the given the turnover. Um, the I I think if a I think that discussion needs to be brought up before the decision to like go to that school that if somebody is, you know, sure they want a position in, in industry um, or government or uh, scientific journalism or law or, uh, or intellectual property, um, then there are ways of figuring out whether or not the PI is supportive. And you, you sometimes don't even have to ask them. You can ask the students for alumni like lists. If I want to join an industry that is concentrated in one location, as in biotech in Boston or the Bay Area, should I go to grad school in the same location? So if you want to join an industry that's concentrated in one location, that is, uh, I don't think it's quite as important as, uh, as one might think. And part of it has to do with the fact that you're very limited, uh, particularly, I hate to say this at an, at an ACS East Bay sponsored event, um, but there, there, there aren't that, I mean, you have Berkeley, Stanford, Davis, Santa Cruz, um, but even once you get, you know, a little bit farther out, the next school is very far away. <laughs> so like, and right. Yeah. And, and you, that's, that's quite far. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in, in, in Boston, there is a little bit more of a clustering of our ones, but really these places represent just a tiny fraction of places. You know, if you, if you want to go to biotech, you know, Atlanta is a great place. Um, Chicago is a great place. Baylor College of Medicine, like Houston in general, um, uh, Austin, Texas, Southern California. These are all great places to be. And I, I left off a million other, you know, fantastic places. So I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that. Yeah. Do students who have an academic gap between undergrad and grad school have an advantage or disadvantage? For me, an a gap between undergraduate and graduate school is a major plus. I have had, uh, when I started my position, um, two of my four graduate students were older than me. Um, this was 10 years ago. Uh, and in fact, when my most current PhD graduate, graduate defended on June 25th, I, for the first time in nine years, became the oldest member of my lab because he had started before they left and he had taken off 10 years to do sound technician work in the music industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm very positive about academic gaps. There are other places where gaps 
are maybe not as desirable and other other places in in one's career and that might be between postdoc and applying for a faculty position or between phd and postdoc where the considerations are a little bit more uh more difficult thank you everybody for your attention and for sticking with us for uh, the whole hour thanks